All right. All right. All right. Thank you, Michael, and hello to everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here. And I will echo Michael's sentiments that it's wonderful to see people from the UK and apparently from Iceland we heard in the chat and I'm sure from other places as well. That's great. Uh, it's wonderful to see the international reach of May as well as William. I am also a big May fan, so I'm really excited to hear Anna talk tonight. So to end, and Canada and Australia, wow. I'm going to stop looking at the chat because I'm just going to get excited about how many people are coming in and uh, I will introduce Anna. So Anna Wager is the Clarence A. Davis Visual Arts Curator at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. Her research interests include arts and crafts movements, contemporary craft and activism, printmaking, communal art making, and the intermediate connections between architecture, bookmaking, and textiles. Her article, Photographs, Pens, and Print, William Morris and the Technologies of Typography, was published in Book History in 2018. She is also an extremely novice letterpress printer. I will say extremely was her words. <laughs> Anna holds a PhD in art history and textual and digital studies from the University of Washington. She is also on the boards of the Arthur Dove Block and the Seward House Museum, both in upstate New York. She has been a member of the William Morris Society since 2018 and currently serves as our treasurer. And thank you. We look forward to the talk. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, it's incredible to see so many of you here and also mildly terrifying for me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, share uh, screen sharing um, as an art historian. You know, I got to got to get the images up as quickly as possible. Let's see. Okay, is that looking good for folks? You're seeing not presenter view, regular view. Awesome. Um, what is this? Uh, thanks for joining us during whatever time of day it is, wherever you are, um, and being brought together through the, the power of the internet. Um, thanks to Sarah for that introduction and to Michael for organizing. It's been fun to visit um, May Morris again. Uh, she's not someone I get to spend a lot of time with in my day-to-day -day life, so it's exciting to, um, to get to do so today. My talk title is a little intentionally vague. Um, a full discussion of May Morris's life and work would take hours or days, not 20 minutes. So it won't be that kind of talk and I'm inevitably going to leave out a lot. Uh, fortunately, there are a ton of experts on this call um, who can and jump in in the Q&A uh, with anything um, that you may have questions about. Even when I narrowed sort of the parameters of this talk down to May Morris and embroidery that I particularly like, that was still way too many things. Um, so I circled back to the word subversive um, I'm interested in art that is subversive, but that doesn't immediately seem to be so. Part of the reason I was drawn to uh, the Morris family in general is that craft has historically been dismissed as not serious, as a lesser art form, and in some way unskilled, uh, which we know is untrue, and also coded in racialized and gendered ways. Um, so to take craft seriously at all in the 19th century was in its own way subversive. The phrase subversive stitch um, or subversive stitching is a reference to Rosika Parker's 1984 book, The Subversive Stitch, Embroidery and the Making of the Feminine, which is a landmark feminist text that unpacks the idea that embroidery and sewing is innately domestic, tied to the home, um, something you do when you don't have something more important to do, something that is in fact anything but subversive. Embroidery played a huge role in the construction of femininity and ideal womanhood in the 19th century, of course, but it was also a method of resistance to those patriarchal structures that governed it, and I would argue against capitalism more broadly, especially for someone like Mae Morris. Um, for this talk, I'm going to try to consciously refer to Mae Morris as Morris and her family members by their first names. Um, we often tend to refer to female artists by their first names. We do the same thing with female authors as well. Um, there's sort of a familiarity to it, but we would never really say William. So I'm going to try and, um, you know, switch that up tonight. So when I say Morris, 
uh, May Morris is the one I'm talking about. So let's um, move on to another image of May at work. I'll circle back to the image that was on my title slide. Uh, we start with an image of her at work um, here in the 1890s at an embroidery frame uh, in her home at 8 Hammersmith Terrace in London. The wallpaper and curtains are Morris and Company designs, and she's seated in a Sussex chair, which was also produced by the firm. Um, she does sometimes aesthetically, um, especially in her housing, sort of toe the company line. Um, not only does the art historical canon, which like most canons was designed by white men, um, not valorize craft because it was and still is viewed as work and not art. Within craft discourse itself, a distinction is made between the designer and the worker with credit given to the designer generally and not the workers. It's much harder to figure out who made these objects rather than who designed them. Um, that's why a lot of things have been credited to William Morris, but designed in fact um, by other people. So I wanted to bridge that kind of designer worker gap today by talking about both Morris's mental and physical work, which for her are interconnected. Um, I'll also note that she, like the rest of her family and their circle, operated within a very upper class, white, relatively progressive area of society, which paints a very narrow picture of 19th century embroidery. She was not a person who needed to embroider for her livelihood, um, but she was also pretty aware of that privileged status as well. The plan for the next 15-ish minutes is to give you a quick biographical sketch, um, an example of an embroidered book and a book on embroidery and talk about the way that these objects may not be outwardly subversive, but that they are. And then I'll close with a discussion of communal art making as a method of resistance. So on to that biographical sketch. Uh, May Morris was born in 1862 to William and Jane. Um, she was the second child in the family after her older sister, Jenny. We can see them in this photo with the Byrne Jones family. Um, Jenny's over here and May is here. Jenny's also a really talented embroiderer. Uh, most of her works were produced for the household and she was epileptic and was under her parents' care for much of her life and really their whole lives and then moved into her sister's care afterwards. She has gotten a lot less scholarly attention, which is something that really needs to shift. Um, there's definitely a conversation about disability and privileging certain types of information to be had here. We have a lot of Morris's writings. We don't have a lot of Jenny's writings. Um, and so that's something that's uh, really ripe for excavation. Both of these women were taught to draw, paint, and sew, uh, like most other upper middle-class girls at the time, but they're learning these things from the most famous artists of the day. They were educated at home um, and then the Notting Hill School for Girls and the National Art Training School. At 23, Morris becomes the head of Morris and Company's embroidery department. It's around this point that her father is really shifting his interest into printing and so she, um, she steps in. She forms the Women's Guild of Arts with embroiderer Mary Elizabeth Turner in 1907 because women weren't allowed in the Art Workers Guild. So even within you know, these, these artist societies, there's, um, there's sexism, of course. Um, she was married to Harry Sparling for eight years in the 1890s and they divorce. Um, her companion for the last 22 years of her life was Mary Lobb. Uh, they met when Lobb was a land girl during World War I. Um, so part of the Women's Land Army, where women were sent to farms uh, to basically help with farming. Um, I'm not sure how true this is, but the story is that Lobb was asked to uh, leave the farm where she had been working because she took too many naps. Uh, which is very relatable to me personally. Um, and the farm was just down the road from Kelmscott Manor. She finds her way to Kelmscott Manor and she stays. Morris dies in 1938 and she left Lobb a benefit in her will and Mary Lobb lived at Kelmscott until her death the following year. So let's get into some art. Um, 
this book is housed in the Grolier Club, which is a private bibliophile club in New York City. And it was unearthed in uh, 2016. So at that point in time, the Fine Bindings collection, of which it was a part, was uncatalogued. And Megan Constantinou, the librarian there, um, who graciously sent me some of this, this backstory and also spoke about this book a bit um, at a talk for the Morris Society in February. Um, so anyway, Megan was planning an event with Mark Samuels Lesner. And the day before this event, one of the other members at the Grolier asked to see some embroidered bindings. And since they were uncatalogued, they pulled everything out from the shelves and this book was just there. And they realized that it was in fact embroidered by Mae Morris. Um, you know, these sorts of archival discoveries don't happen very often. <laughs> um, it's a really stunning book. I photographed it in uh, the winter of 2016, and it really has been pretty untouched um, from the 1930s onwards, from what we can tell. And so the condition is like astonishingly good. It's made of green silk embroidered with colored silk, gold braid, and beads, and it covers a book titled Embroidery and Lace which was published in London in 1888 um, from a translation. Uh, it was originally published in French. The translator uh, is named Alan S. Cole and Cole and Morris were friends. The book is a history of embroidery from antiquity to the present, which is a subject that would have been obviously of particular interest to Morris. On the cover here, we see the initials E.L. and A.C. So E.L. is the French author, A.C. is Alan Cole. And then there's a tiny initial M that's stitched at the bottom of the spine. We know it was in the collection of Samuel Putnam Avery in New York City. We don't really know how or why. Um, he first showed it at the Grolier in 1903, and then uh, they acquired it in the 1930s. So um, I'll show you a couple more details here. So this is actually just the... Um, a couple pages from the Library of Congress version of this text. Um, it's a very pedestrian book. I mean, it was mass printed. Um, the language was, um, you know, the content was clearly written by someone who knew a lot about embroidery, but was maybe not a practitioner of it. This is a pretty common situation uh, for these sort of manuals written by men. Um, where it's not entirely clear how much of the work they had physically done themselves. That makes a difference, which I'm going to talk about momentarily. And um, here's just a detail of the spine. I just, you know, I, I think this is a stunning piece of work. Um, I really love how the, the tendrils are kind of creeping up over the edge of the book, just like a very smartly designed um, object. Again, not a surprise. The Ashmolean Museum has um, many of Morris's sketches in its collection. It also has a really awesome online database. So if this is something you are interested in, um, you know, I encourage you to go over and, uh, and take a look. Um, and you can really see kind of the genesis of this design here, the way she's thinking of this as a holistic object, the way that the design is fronting both the front and back covers. Um, very smartly done. And then here's a few more additional details. So the back cover here, this like, incredible stamped um, gold embossed uh, paper edge, and then even the bookmark. So on the surface, um, this, this probably doesn't seem like a subversive object, but what I find interesting about it is the tension between this being an impressive piece of art on the one hand that is covering something that's pretty mundane, but what it's covering is a book that honors the process of embroidery by making an embroidered object. It's a declaration of intent and importance that is subtle but pointed because it takes women's work seriously. It also fits into a Victorian revival of book embroidering, which Jennifer Robertson has written about. And I can get into that more in the question and answer period um, if folks are, are interested. Um, basically, embroidering a binding uh, from the 16th century onward was a way to highlight importance, to indicate that this object was something of value. And so when we look at other embroidered bindings in the 19th century, they're usually not affixed to commercially printed manuals about handwork, for example. 
um, there's something kind of sneaky and interesting in, in what she's doing here. And so we move on to not an embroidered binding, but Morris's book about embroidery, um, a subversiveness in quantifying and again, taking this type of art making seriously, not just for herself, but for the communities in which she was a part and to extend that art making onwards. Um, in the most recent edition of Useful and Beautiful, there's an article by Courtney Gifford about the importance of decorative needlework. So I would encourage y'all to check that out. Um, the book is not so much a how-to embroidery guide, although it does include information about you know, the different stitches that you can produce, um, but it's more a way to think about design holistically. So it's really um, a manual and something that sets you up to do your own work, to make your own design decisions. Uh, this is something that Morris and Company does a little bit. They have embroidery kits that you can buy and produce your own work. Those are pretty prescribed in terms of design. So this is something that's, um, you know, even more honoring kind of the intention of the artist. Um, Morris, as always, is taking needlework and embroidery very seriously. Um, in her opening text of decorative needlework, she says as much, quote, I am inclined to take needle art seriously and regard its simply priceless decorative qualities worth as careful study or appreciation as any other form of art. In the post-industrial revolution moment that the Morrises were, were working and, um, and advocating for different working conditions, working slowly in a non-industrialized factory setting was an act of resistance in and of itself. This is brilliantly explicated on the printing side by Elizabeth Carolyn Miller in her book, Slow Print, Literary Radicalism and Late Victorian Print Culture. And there's a corollary to embroidery here as well. In our contemporary world, we kind of refigure this um, when folks talk about self-care and taking time away to do something else that's slow and meditative. I think in a, a broad sense, the same was true um, in the 19th century. There's a particular type of privilege in that, but um, certainly related. When uh, the William Morris Gallery in Walthamstow had a May Morris exhibition in uh, the winter of 2018, um, they had these blown up pages from decorative needlework on the walls. And then they had these embroidery hoops placed around the space where you could go down to the front desk and get a needle and come back and try and do some stitches. Um, you can see some of my terrible examples over here to the left. Um, and I really loved this. I loved that they made it something that was active and engaging and sort of gave you a sense of how difficult a lot of this work is to do. Um, the book itself is oversized. It has really large margins. And so the intention was the ability to annotate it, to do your own drawings in the space, again, to make this kind of a collaborative endeavor, um, which again, not super common um, for, for these other guides at the time. Like her father and like John Ruskin and his defense of the Gothic, in decorative needlework, Morris advises readers to avoid looking at modern work to inspiration and instead to study the medieval embroideries at the South Kensington Museum. So we're very briefly just going to look at one of these medieval embroideries, which is actually kind of my entry point into May Morris. Um, these embroideries were referred to as opus anglicanum, which means the best of English work. And May Morris becomes an expert in them. Her American lecture tour focused in large part on medieval embroidery, which is a very strange thing to do. Um, it's not, I think, what people expected her to be talking about. Um, she goes to an exhibition of this work in 1905. And her immediate takeaway is that, why do we value medieval cathedrals and illuminated books, and we don't value something like this, which was, was a cloak that would have been worn by a priest in an ecclesiastical setting. Um, it's a very socialist and proto-feminist response. Um, she writes extensively about it in her review of this exhibition, and she takes it upon herself to really study these objects as a worker, but also as a scholar. Um, one of the things that she does is 
draws these very strange diagrams of stitch patterns. So again, going through English embroidery, going through Florentine embroidery, um, and marking out the ways that in this, these two examples, the, um, the cheeks of these figures are created. So this figure is on the cope that I just showed you. It's kind of hard to tell in PowerPoint, but there's a um, spiral pattern on the cheekbone. So again, an English style. This is actually St. Margaret, who is the patron saint of embroiderers. Um, in the rest of the image, she's actually stabbing a dragon in the head, uh, but I sadly had to cut that out. Um, so I've given you, again, just a tiny, tiny slice of what, um, what Morris is, is doing in some of her scholarly work and some of her creative endeavors. And her work intersects with more outwardly subversive movements, uh, particularly the Hammersmith Socialist League. So um, I believe if memory serves, this is, um, she's over here and then William is over here. There's a history in many suffrage or labor organizations of banner making as a community building exercise, sort of in the tradition of sewing circles as well. Um, this is something that still happens in my community. I suspect it happens in many of yours as well. And it's obviously different from her more esoteric writings and makings. It's public and it's bold in a different way. But I think they share a common thread of wanting to increase visibility and engagement and belonging, as well as venerating a past way of art making. So that idea of the medieval guild, something that is inherently communal, um, is something that is a through line for her. Um, through her work. Um, I'm including this later banner from the Women's Social and Political Union in Hammersmith, uh, dates from 1910. And uh, the horseshoe and hammer are the, the symbols that they've chosen to represent Hammersmith. So literally a hammer and a blacksmith um, output. Um, and the phrasing deeds, not words, um, is one that I think, you know, she actually kind of embodies both uh, deeds and words. Uh, she was pathbreaking in a lot of ways and she wrote it all down, uh, much like her father, an inveterate kind of um, recorder of her own history in some ways. And so even though she herself is less of a communally oriented artist, um, she fostered those sorts of organizations and partnerships. And I think, um, you know, in the ways that, that we now look back to the 19th century and draw um, sort of visual markers from our own protest movements. Um, I included this image from, you know, the, I think the 1920 election. Um, as someone who lives very close to Seneca Falls and sees this sort of suffrage reenactment occurring at things like protests, um, it feels very similar to me in some ways to the ways that May was looking back to the medieval period uh, to, to draw examples from it um, and to sort of find um, a space to, to orient herself and her work, that historical continuity. So we started with Morris at a tapestry loom. Um, we're gonna close with Morris at a tapestry loom. Uh, this photo was taken in 1920. And I'm bookending with images of her at work because there is a subversiveness in being visible when society doesn't want you or your labor to be um, a large reason why embroidery was put forward as a feminine art in the 19th century was because you could do it in your home and then tuck it away when you needed to entertain guests or take on household chores or all of those things. It's something that's inherently kind of um, easy to hide. So Morris's later correspondence is pretty introspective and often dismissive in some ways about her life and her work. In a 1936 letter to George Bernard Shaw, she stated that, quote, I'm a remarkable woman, always was, though none of you seem to think so. It's a quotation I've always found particularly devastating, but also powerful, because I think she really knew how impressive she was and how little that could be regarded or understood by her peers. And there's a sentimental part of me that would want her to know that there have been exhibitions about her work and books and care and interest. 
and that 101 years after this photograph was taken that we're here talking about her. Thank you for being here for it. All right, and I am more than happy to take questions um, and we'll do my best with those. Um, good morning from Australia, if I may ask. Um, do we know anything about who embroidered the Hammersmith Suffragettes banner? Great question. Um, let me see if I have anything particular in my notes about it. Um, I know we know the organizers of this particular branch of the Women's Social and Political Union uh, was founded in February 1907 by Frances Rowe. Um, it looked, I, I mean, again, this is not something I know a ton about, but it looks like there was a split between two different suffrage groups. Um, that's about all I know about it. Um, there's obviously a huge tradition of em embroidering in, in British suffrage circles. Um, so, I would be curious to find out more. Um, I suspect there's there's probably research on it. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. This is something I'm becoming more interested in myself. I, I'm um, a researcher, um, recently graduated with my master's from from uh, Charles Sturt University in Australia, mm. and I specialize in the history of girl guides. There are quite a few connections between girl guides, the suffragette movement. Um, and a number of other things, uh, you know, the Fabians, the Parents National Education Union as well. And that's, that's sort of what I'm exploring in my PhD. So I'm sort of curious when I come across things like that and I'm, I'm having to really delve into the suffragette movement to find out more about some of the women that came over because uh, initially the Girl Guides rejected a connection with the suffragettes because they didn't want to be seen as, as blue stockings and, and, uh, and dangerous for um, young girls to be getting involved in, uh, especially if you read Dr Fern Riddell's um, Death in 10 Minutes. I don't know if you've read that, but it is an amazing book. Uh, and it talks about uh, the life of, of Kitty Marion and the uh, and exactly how dangerous the suffragettes actually were. They were regarded as more dangerous than the uh, the IRA at one point, uh, and there was only really a truce called on the violence at the start of the First World War, uh, and it was then that the suffragettes moved into the auxiliary women's services, and from thence they started to move into the girl guide movement after the war. Uh, and after women's suffrage was given in, in Britain. Uh, so yeah, I'm, it, I, there's, a, there's a tradition of embroidering um, patrol emblems for girl guides and, and badges and, and things like that, which interests me greatly. And I just, I just keep finding these little, little cross links. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, that was kind of my question was, um... I would imagine they were teaching embroidery to the girl guides in a very systematic sort of way. And so um, what are the ways that that's then being maybe taken and reinterpreted? Um, Morris herself has kind of an interesting relationship to suffrage in that she very much supported it, but definitely from kind of the socialist angle and that she thought, you know, voting should be universal, at least in, in my reading of, of her. Um, but I know when she was on that American lecture tour, she got a lot of questions about suffrage that she really wasn't expecting because the timing was 1909. And so like this question was heating up obviously in all of these places. Mm -hmm. And she initially didn't really know how to talk about it. And then towards the end had kind of like worked up an answer that she felt comfortable with. But um, yeah, it seems like something that she was sympathetic to but not actively involved in, but there are so many ties between 
you know, the groups she was involved in and the way that the material culture floats between both. Well, I'm, Thank I'm you. Genuinely, yeah, genuinely curious to find out whether she actually had any connections herself with the Girl mm -hmm. Guides because we had units in Hammersmith. We had some quite significant units in Hammersmith. I can't access that paperwork from here at the moment. That would be buried in a salt mine in Cheshire at the moment uh, in, <laughs> in the UK. But um, if the types of ladies who were running those units in Hammersmith would have been hanging around people like William Morris and, and May, well, May, May Morris uh, and uh, William would have been well and truly gone, sorry, brain. Uh, but they, they, they would have been hanging around her. So it's entirely possible that she was brought in to actually teach the embroideries badges and maybe even advise on it. So. Mm. Thank you. I, have Thank a, you. I have a brief comment about that. Uh, I know that May had some connection with the women's in, the founding of the Women's Institute, um, which isn't directly related to the Girl Guides, but one of the first WIs that existed was in Kelmscott, and she was friends with the woman who founded it. So mm -hmm. if you're investigating those kinds of links, I have no idea what the connection might be between the WI and the Girl Guides, but there are these kind of other threads with her. Yes, um, lead, I think. Mm, thank you for that. I think there's a book about um, the history of Kevin Scott that talks about that, and I can try to find a citation for you and put it in the chat. Um, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to say to everyone, uh, my uh, computer froze. Uh, we are back at now, and given the large number of people, um, I would urge you to put any questions in your chat, and I will uh, feed those to uh, Anna. And um, Anna, maybe while we're waiting for message to come up in chat, um, I have an observation that might be productive for you to just think aloud about, which is that uh, William Morris, as a student at Exeter College, um, paid to have a bookbinder in Oxford um, bind in a medieval fashion two books he owned, um, Carlyle's Past and Present and uh, the um, second volume of uh, Ruskin's Modern Painters. And I wonder if, would you be interested in speculating about the subversive nature of what May, May Morris's choice for the book she had, uh, she bound her embroidery and lace versus her father's um, decision to um, to uh, bind his copies of Carlisle and Ruskin in the eighteen uh, in the eighteen fifties. Sure, um, that's a great question, and I I don't. You know, I, I haven't thought about her um, her embroidery binding work uh, much in a while, but she did do several designs, um, usually for other people, which is interesting. And so that's one thing for embroidery and lace. We don't really know who the intended um, owner was. Um, like I said, she was friends with the translator. Very likely, you know, he had approached her about this. We do know that sometimes she had she embroidered a copy of. Uh, William's book, Love is Enough. And so, you know, like we, we know she did things for, for people that she was friends with or close to and um, would often pull motifs from the books themselves. And so that's not something I associate with medieval binding, but again, I don't know a ton about that either. Um, I think for her, a lot of it was referencing the history of stitches um, in honor of, the content of the book. So like when, when I showed the, you know, sort of the zoomed in details of the book cover, there are a lot of different types of stitches happening on it. And they're very, very tiny. And it took a ton of skill to do that. So in some ways it's this virtuoso sort of presentation. And so again, that visibility is something that I think is, you know, arguably pretty subversive as well. Um, she was not shy about being a virtuoso. Um, and so um, I guess that's kind of how I would read it is like he, the way that the Kelmscott books were also initially 
found just in the calf vellum, right? And like they all had the green ribbon and then you could decide what you wanted to do with them afterwards, like a very standardized kind of guild practice. Um, and she's up to something very different than that. Great, the questions are pouring in. Um, let me, uh, uh, we have a nice uh, general one. Uh, could you say something about her work for the firm, Morris & Co? Um, that's a great question. And I think there are probably many people on this call that are actually more qualified to answer it than I am. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I know she was, uh, she was employed there for many years. She stayed on a bit after William's death. I want to say she wrapped up in the late 1890s. And when people have talked about her historically, that's kind of where the story has ended. Like we knew she worked for the firm. We knew she did design work. Um, the, I, I can show and tell for a second and say that there is this um, really wonderful exhibition catalog from that show in Walthamstow that details the different embroideries for the company that she designed. Um, so this has been an, an excavating process. Um, because again, like a lot of things were, were assigned to her father um, that, that were in fact not um, his designs. And so she did a lot of um, designs for the kits. Um, she also did some tapestry designs. She would be uh, hired occasionally to, to work on those tapestries, usually with someone else as kind of an educational um, teaching. She did, she did do lessons like she, um, you know, had a, had a pay structure if you wanted to take lessons with her on embroidery. And so she would often be using things from the company. Um, there's a million more things to say about it, but, but that's the general sense is designer, um, you know, sort of overseeing the workroom, although I'm not 100% sure what that would have entailed, and then stepping out um, in the late 19th century. Would, there was a question about her compensation. Uh, do you want to talk about her as a, uh, a worker for um, wages? Sure, and I think that's something, again, like this, this tension with her work generally is she was financially set, right? Like she didn't really need to be doing this. Um, she was paid. I, I'm not, again, 100% sure of what that looked like if it was just she was on the company payroll and that was it. Um, but like I said, she did do um, additional work for other people. So she gave lessons. She um, could be persuaded to embroider things um, like that love is enough cover that I mentioned earlier was something the publisher approached her about and that she was compensated for. Um, so that was a pretty standard practice uh, for her at the time. But again, something that, you know, her, her livelihood wasn't um, wasn't resting on either. There was, there was a question, uh, Anna, about her U.S. tour. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us uh, what you know about that. Sure. Um, so I know Margareta Frederick has written a bit about this, and there's another scholar whose name I'm totally blanking on. I want to say it's like Thorison or something along those lines. Um, and it's really interesting. So in the tradition of, of American lecture tours, you know, she's following folks like Oscar Wilde and Ashby and um, some of the other arts and crafts uh, dudes. Um, but she, she structures it basically around, um, at least in part, on these medieval embroideries. Like she, she has a slideshow. Um, she did publish, I believe, in the Burlington Magazine on Opus Anglicanum, I want to say it's four short articles, um, but again, I can double check that and, you know, get back to folks if you're interested. Um, and it was a circuit uh, that it took her at least over to Chicago because I know she was at Hull House for a period and then looped back around. Um, the one anecdote I really like from this is that she, um, she did make a stop near East Aurora, uh, which is kind of in my neck of the woods, and some of you may know as the home of the Roy Crofters, and Albert Hubbard really wanted to meet her, and she basically said that he was a fraud who was ripping off her father and refused to talk to him. So, <laughs> um, you know, again, not shy about, about opinion sharing, but um, yeah, the, I know there were there were definitely stops in New York City and in Philadelphia and then some points west as well. It was about seven months long, I believe. So, 
Super. And um, there was a question, are her uh, notes on medieval embroidery available? I, yes, I believe so. Um, there are, like I said, some really short published articles on um, this particular exhibition that she went to in 1905. So she analyzes a few different examples of medieval embroidery. Um, and like I said, I'm pretty sure that was in the Burlington Magazine, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so definitely there, there's definitely some on it in, um, in the exhibition catalog. I would fully believe that, that there are notes um, in an archive that, that she would have used um, as well that maybe are not published, but there's at least some things that are, that are available. Anna, could I just step in there? This is Lynn Holt speaking. I edited the volume on May Morris Art and Life. Um, <laughs> and just, just to add a bit more about um, May's writings on medieval embroidery. Yes, you're quite right about the articles that were in the Burlington magazine. Um, she had a series of articles on the Pienza, the Ascoli and the Zion Cope. But she was actually writing about a medieval embroidery right from 1888. Her first article that she ever published was a defensive chain stitch, which she she inadvertently thought was the stitch that was actually used in Opus Anglicanum, but um, that was later corrected because it's not chain stitch, it's actually split stitch. Um, but there's quite a lot about um, her views on medieval embroidery in the series that she wrote for the Building News um, in 1892 to 93. Um, and obviously, I mean, you've already pointed out the decorative needlework. There's a lot in that about medieval embroidery as well. So, you know, every opportunity that May had to say something, you know, had to say, a, give a lecture or to publish, there is always something written about some aspect of medieval embroidery. Um, the lecture that she gave on her American lecture tour is actually in the William Morris Gallery. And there's a manuscript um, of that. There are also lots of slides which are divided between the art workers giving and the William Morris Society actually have her slides that go with the lecture tour of the medieval embroideries. And there are lots of photographs in the Ashmolean collection as well of the embroideries that she studied. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, that's, that's really exciting. Thanks for a very interesting paper. Actually, could I ask a question while I've, I've still sort of got the floor slightly here? Um, do we know about the embroidery and lace is it that possible that she did it for Avery or is it possible that she did it for somebody else and it just happens to come into Putnam Avery's collection in 1891? Because I've often wondered if she had actually had been commissioned by Alan Summerlee Cole to produce the embroidery binding. That, so that's my sense. Um, I don't know if we know for sure. I certainly, I don't think she had, I don't think she was commissioned by Avery would be my read on yeah, it. I yeah. think she was commissioned by Cole, but if she was commissioned by Cole, I don't know why it would have well, been. That well, that would be really interesting because actually I'm just working on Alan Summerlee Cole at the moment. And as you probably know, I mean, he was producing catalogues of the embroideries in the South Kensington Museum. And you know, he's heavily involved in needlework and writing about needlework and lace and so mm -hmm. on. So it would kind of make sense given that he's the translator of this volume and no May Morris that he would have potentially commissioned her to do this and I mean the, together they both gave you know, the series of Cantor lectures to the Royal, to the Society of Arts as well so there are lots of overlaps between them and it would be great to think that this is perhaps a binding that was done for Cole but who knows mm -hmm. but it's just interesting that it happens to have the initials AC and um, Ernest Lefebvre who is that, of course is the author that Cole's translating at and, you know, just have these sort of fond ideas that perhaps that's what the reason is, but who knows, it'd be lovely to know more about that. But thank you very much for an interesting paper, anyhow. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would be super curious about what that connection looked like and what the relationship was between Cole and Avery. I don't know a ton about Avery. I know he was uh, the head of the Met Museum or he was very intimately involved with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and we do know that the book was in an exhibition in 1903. So it's predating her arrival in America yeah. by six years too. Um, but I, that idea of her collaborating with Cole um, makes a lot of sense to me. We do have writings for some of the other embroidered bindings where she very clearly is kind of in conversation with other people about them. Um, yeah. So that, that would make sense. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, Anna, there was a question. Uh, did May Morris uh, write about socialism? Can you talk uh, a little bit about her uh, involvement in, social, uh, in socialism and uh, uh, did, she, um, did she publish about it? 
Great question that I have absolutely no idea about. Um, if if there's someone here who who does, please step in. I'm I'm sure she did. Um, I just don't know about that side as much. I mean, obviously, I know of, of her involvement. Um, we know she wrote a lot. Lynn, if you wanna, if you wanna, yeah. Take well, it. she was editing. She edited the Common Wheel with her husband Sparling. Um, so, and she does make comments. I mean, you know, she's she's contributing to to the the socialist movement and you know, sort of musical entertainments and all that kind of thing. It does come out occasionally in her writings, but not not to the same extent that her father is beating the drum for socialism, certainly. Yeah, and she certainly writes about it when she's writing about her father, but it's about her father's socialism. So exactly. people are asking That's, about her. Yeah, you've always got to sort of see it. See the lens, so haven't you? Yeah. Of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will say for people who've been asking about her writing, she did write introduction. She edited all of her father's uh, collected works, which is 24, 26 volumes. 24 volumes, volumes yeah. Thank Extraordinary. It's, I read them all about a year, uh, several years ago for my dissertation, but those are kind of wonderful little bits if you're looking specifically for her writing on her father, but also for her own voice. She reminisces about her childhood. Her own opinions very much do appear. And she also wrote longer kind of biographical pieces about her father. And as I said, in those, certainly socialism comes up, but it's not theoretical writing on socialism. It's more about the history of the movement. Um, I'm going to share my screen again for a second, just because um, there was an image that I cut for time, but this is an image of um, Morris at work in um, basically doing that editorial work um, of her father's writings. And there, are, I'm, I'm interested in paintings or depictions of her by other figures. And so I've, I've done a tiny bit of looking into who Mary Annie Sloan was and what their relationship might have been, but um, I really love these piles of paper everywhere that feels extremely relatable to me. Um, and also sort of given like the Herculanean task that she was trying to undertake here. Um, but again, the idea of her being this real, you know, uh, vanguard for her father's work and the shaping of his legacy is something that I think, you know, we're still excavating um, and I'll be excited to see what else uh, what else folks come up with there. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, there have not been any more uh, questions coming up in the in the chat. Um, we are uh, um, at the 15 minute mark. Um, I think we can um, um, bring things to a close. I did want to mention to people, I encourage you to type into the chat if you uh, have any topics that you would like to see us address in the future. Obviously, uh, May Morris was a, uh, a winner in terms of uh, attracting a large number uh, of attendees uh, to our talks. And the society is lucky to have access to people with um, expertise in all areas of, of Morris and uh, arts and crafts and related topics. So I encourage you to uh, type into the chat ideas for our future events. Just a reminder again that on October 20th, um, Margareta Frederick of the Delaware Art Museum will be presenting on the Delaware uh, Museum's pre raphaelite collection. So, we might have had an internet situation, <laughs> um, but I, I guess Sarah or I can kind of wrap things up. Um, you know, Sarah, happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as Michael was saying, Margareta Frederick will be talking about the recent rehang the pre-Raphaelite collection at the Delaware Art Museum, which is the most important pre-Raphaelite collection in public, in an open collection outside of the UK. Um, it's been a great project and that'll be a great talk. I put the link in the chat. And if you are a member, as usual, you will receive that link. I will repeat Michael's uh, statement at the beginning about uh, joining the society as well as getting immediate access to all of our talks and some private, more social events. You also currently will receive a wonderful letterpress broadside, which is a limited edition uh, 
limited quantity for people who join now. If you're a current member, please encourage your friends to join because you will receive a broadside as well as them if they say that they that you were that you referred them, excuse me. Um, also, as a member, you receive the Journal of William Morris Studies and our wonderful magazine, which Anna referenced, Useful and Beautiful, which includes articles on all kinds of things involving the arts and crafts movement. May, William, uh, it's a beautiful little uh, piece of work that I am always excited to get in my uh, mailbox. And I think that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming. It was wonderful to see such a wonderful crowd. And if you have any more questions, um, I don't Sarah? know. Sarah? Yes. It's Adrian. Sorry, I don't have a video going. Um, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Hi, Adrian. Okay. Hi, so I'm membership coordinator. Um, yes, uh, there's a question. Can people who are not in the States join? And absolutely, we do have members from different countries. So um, yeah, we'd love it if you join. Thank you.